yes, you call me. Deeper still, yes, you call me. Deeper still, yeah, you call me. Deeper still in the love, love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. We're going to be in uh, Galatians chapter 4 again, and uh, we're going to be in, uh, starting in verse 21. So we're going to be in verse 21 there, and uh, this story of Hagar and Sarah is actually a really, probably this, when, when he, Paul uses it here as an illustration or as an analogy, but it really deserves its own sermon, so we won't, I'll try to not dive too much into that, the customs and history and all of that, because I'll tell you, it's really fascinating stuff, but, uh, and not, not just for a scholar like me, right? It's, it's actually, there's some deep history here that we could get into, but uh, we're getting kind of the last third of Galatians. We're, we're on the last hurrah here, uh, and what I kind of want to talk about is uh, he again, he hits this concept of sons and daughters. But he hits it again uh, with the idea, okay, that we are not, I want to be clear about this, that we are not just any old sons and daughters. Because in a sense, we're all sons and daughters of God, right? But what he's getting at with the, in this passage is that there are those who were born to, inher- or are, are to inherit the kingdom of God. There are those who are in, going to inherit the promise of freedom and salvation, and those who aren't. They're all created by God, right? We're all, we all are. He created everything. But what, what Paul is getting at here And he even goes back, he's going back to the Jewish idea of the first century. Um, The Jewish idea that that they were chosen people, right? And this is what he's harking it to. And they are a chosen people. But what he's saying is, there's only one that's going to inherit the kingdom. That's what he's saying here. Not that God doesn't have plans for Israel or God doesn't have plans for the Jewish people, but that what he's getting at here is that God wants, God is saying, I sent my son for a purpose, to bring freedom from the old ways, from the old things. So let's read here, starting in verse 21. This is quite a passage, so so hang with me here. It says, tell me, tell me. You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave 
was born according to the flesh. While the sons of the free woman was born through promise. Now this is to be interpreted allegorically. So he's using this as an allegory, as a, an example of how, of how the spiritual works when it comes to Christ. So let's keep moving. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing um, children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai, or, or excuse me, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Sorry, I got, got off there. For she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who is who does not bear break forth and cry aloud you who are not in labor for the children of the desolate will be more than those of the one who has a husband now you brothers like isaac are children of promise but just as at just as at that time he who who was born according to the flesh persecuted him uh, who was born according to the spirit so also it is now, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So what, what is going on here? This is kind of crazy, right? A um, lot of technical stuff, and I could go back and read, we could almost go back and do a complete study on it, but the first, there's a couple of things that you need to know what's going on here. Paul is not saying that Hagar was less than in the sense of, if you go back to read the original story, actually God blesses Hagar and Ishmael. You actually read it. There's a, he actually promises his own promise to them, right? But there's a couple of key dynamics that I do want to draw out of that passage. First of all, Sarah and Abram, Sarai and Abram, at the time he originally would come, Sarah and Abraham, um, were, try, were waiting for the promised child. That was Isaac, all right? And as they were waiting for the promised child, they began to understand that this was going to take a while. And they got a little impatient. And so Hagar was actually the servant of Sarai. Now, this is interesting because this was a custom back then, is what lost, a lot of scholars think, that when a woman was barren, that the servant would be given to a man in order to have children so that there would be somewhere for all this inheritance to go. All right? The only way to inherit uh, was to be a son at the time. Sorry, ladies, I didn't write the rules, okay? Um, I'm just saying this is the way it was. Um, and, and it was a very, um, it could be very painful. You've got to understand what Sarah was going through here. She knew, uh, she knew that there was, there was a pain. There, if you've ever known someone who has never been able to have children or it was, a, it was an issue, it, it's, a, it's a deep hurt, and that's what Sarah was going through. And this was their culture's way of addressing that. They did, they did have adoption, but it was, it was kind of a, uh, it was kind of, a, uh, it, it, it could be challenged, let's put it that way. And so what, what Sarah was trying to accomplish was to, get, was to accomplish God's promise through her own work. That's, that's a dangerous thing to do. If God promises you something, trying to accomplish it through your own works is not going to work very well. Now, don't get me wrong, we have a part to play. Okay? But it's important for us to understand that this set up a dichotomy within Abraham and Sarah's family. Once Isaac came along, Isaac was... Isaac was uh, the son of the free woman, the, the first wife. The, this, was a, this was something that uh, put him in a place to inherit even above his older brother. 
potentially. We don't know. It's, it's a little fuzzy on how, that customs, how the customs worked back then. Um, and what, was, what Paul is drawing out here, and, and some people would argue that the hermeneutics here were probably, uh, the hermeneutics being the, you know, biblical, con- biblical interpretation through context, right? Making sure that the context is right. Uh, that, that Paul's biblical hermeneutics here were a little bit, he was stretching it. <laughs> but and he even met, he admits it. He says, this is an allegory, okay? This is an allegory of what we, first century Jews would have got it. They would have been, oh yeah, okay, that, this actually makes sense. For us, it's a little harder to understand. But just to understand that what he says in the passage is that you can either be children of promise or children of slavery. We've kind of touched on this, we've danced around it, but here he dresses it head on. He says that the, anything under our own strength, anything under works by alone, without faith, is slavery. Right? You're working yourself to death to, to meet an expectation that you'll never meet on your own. And uh, in one, of the thi- one of the things that caused the death of... So back in the old days, you had means, okay? You were nobility or minor, minor nobility or even just well off. You had servants, okay? Maybe they weren't slaves. They, a lot of times they were paid... Think of like old England, okay, Downton Abbey. You guys seen Downton Abbey, right? One of the reasons that fell off was because there were so many rules that were followed by these servants. You couldn't get married. You couldn't. You had to live on on the estate. You had to. You had to commit totally to the estate, right? Well, nobody wants to live that way. People want to grow. People want to grow up. They want to have families. They want to. They want to have their own life, something that's theirs. The problem with these estates were nothing was belonged to the servants, right? And it was, a, it was a slavery by another name. What happened was, was during the, the turn of the last century, that began to change. The old ways began to fall, fall away because people realized that in order for it to be a truly free society that there had to be there had to be change and what paul is grasping at here is he's under, he's wanting us to understand that you cannot live in both camps you cannot live under the slave woman even though he was the firstborn and Part of the, what created the conflict, by the way, between the slave and the free woman was uh, a contempt that Hagar had for Sarah after marriage and he had, she had a son. There was, you can go back and read it on your own, but it is, there, was a, there was a great kind of tension there, and it wasn't a healthy thing. And I think a lot of people do that with God, don't they? They see that they need God in their lives, and they're frustrated, they're angry even. And the tension builds between them and God. But until they recognize that they have to lay down the old ways, that they can't, they can't inherit the promise under slavery to sin and death. They can only inherit life under freedom. Now, this may be a little hard to grasp, but I want to make sure that we, can, we push it out. Uh, I liken it to this. Sometimes we look at, um, we look at uh, life, and God asks you to do something, right? You follow Sarah, you follow, you know, like Paul is saying here, you know, it, it, was it fair to Ishmael that he didn't get to inherit? No, it wasn't fair. But God had a way he was going to do it. And it wasn't God's fault that they tried to decide to do it a different way, right? So, um, 
I, I liken it, there was a parable I heard once of a man who uh, received a call from God, okay? And he goes, he spends four years at Bible college, he gets his degree, and all right, Lord, where do you want, where do you want to send me? I want you to go, son, to the mountains. Okay, Lord, I'll go to the mountains. Okay. I want you to buy a cabin, all right? I'll buy a cabin. Who lives there, Lord? No one. Oh, okay. I, well, Lord, I, I spent all this time and money going to Bible college to minister to your people. Just, just trust me, son. Do what I tell you. And he goes, he buys the cabin, and he goes to live in the mountains. And he wakes up the first day, so, all right, Lord, what, do you have, what would you have me do? And he says, you see that boulder over there? He says, yes, Lord. He says, I want you to go push on it. Okay, Lord. You know, the guy's like, just a little aware. That's a big boulder, God. I don't know. Go, go push on it. Okay. So he goes and he pushes on it. And, and it's practically barely can get it, you know, move it at half inch. Can't even flip it over. Really heavy rock. <laughs> he pushes on it, and he said, and he goes, "All right, Lord, I tried. No, keep doing." Pushes on it all day. And all the way till dark, he's exhausted. He goes and he lays down. Doesn't even pray anymore. He's just exhausted. He goes, grabs a quick bite hands are blistered, lays down, goes to sleep. The man gets up the next day and says, God, what would you have me do today? Go push on that rock till you move it. And he keeps pushing on it and pushing on it and pushing on it. And at one point, the man finally just says, God, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. Because the man had been pushing on it for years at this point. Every day, he would ask God what he wanted to do. And every day, he'd push on this rock. So the, sometimes to the point where his hands would bleed. And he finally just gives up and says, God, I'm not doing this anymore. And he goes and he sits in his cabin and he says, you, you can't make me. <laughs> you know, kind of one of those moments with God, right? And God speaks to the man he says, I want you to go push on it one more time. I want you to give it everything. I want you to give it everything that you have. And he goes and he pushes on it, and the rock moves this time. He's actually able to flip the rock all the way over. And he said, and God looks at the man, and he says, I want you to look at your hands. He looks down, and there's calluses, seemingly almost like an inch thick, like just really thick calluses. And... The man goes, I think I get it now, Lord. He says, and God says, now look at your arms. And his arms were big and strong. His legs were thick like tree trunks. And now he, the, man look, the God looks at the man and goes, now you're ready to go minister to the people that I've called you to. purpose of that parable is for us to understand that God is calling us to freedom. And sometimes we want to do it our own way, like Sarah and Abraham, but that way leads to slavery. And though it sometimes may seem harder to live the life of freedom, because it's a choice of, of sometimes self-denial, it's a choice that says, I'm going to choose you, God, over what makes me feel better. I want to choose you, God, over what what I want. And when you look at this passage that we've read this morning, you begin to understand that what Paul is getting at was that the Jews were comfortable with Judaism. They were comfortable with the old ways. They were comfortable with the way they used to do things. 
But you see, God was calling them to a new promise, to a, a promise that he had promised Abraham himself, that, that, that promise that, that would go to, that would lead to the freedom that we can only find in Christ. And just like that man pushing on that rock, that sometimes if we don't get it, we don't understand, sometimes life just hurts. And we want to just quit. 2020 has been a year, hadn't it? Both for our nation and better for each other. What God is saying is don't give up. Your children of the promise, your children of freedom. You are children. You're children of the free woman, not of the slave. You, you, he knows how to give good gifts to his children. In fact, the passage in Matthew says it as much. Matthew chapter 7, it says, Or which of you, which, or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in he who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? He is a God of promise. He's made promises in His Word. You are uh, uh, children of the free woman, not of the slave. I want to make sure that you're getting this this morning. If I'm pounding on it, if, I, if it's taken me a minute to get here, I want you to understand that God wants you to get Get it through our heads that he loves you enough that he, will, he, he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins, that he, you are not going, he's not going to just let you sit there and rot. That death was, is not your destiny, but life. Yes, these bodies might deteriorate, these bodies might die, but our spirit will live with him. Otherwise, if we don't allow him to do that, we're enslaved, as, the, as the, our passage says, we're enslaved to those elementary principles. As we read a, a week or two ago about, uh, I want us to go back to verse 6 in this chapter 4 here. It says this, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That's what this passage is about. He's saying, you're not a son cast out, in, cast out of the camp. You're not a son that is thrown to the curb. You are a son that has been adopted and brought in. You are a daughter who has been adopted in. You're, you're, you're princes and princesses of the king. Now, if you go into your work tomorrow and say, I'm a prince to your boss, I will deny ever saying that. But you get my point, I think. I was remembering this concept of listening to God and understanding our, what he is calling us to do. Just like that man pushing on a rock, I was, I, it reminded me of a story. I worked at a restaurant for about a year in college and I'll be honest with you, I was a terrible waiter, okay? I, I, it takes a certain single-minded organization and focus to be a waiter, and I had, I, I'm too ADD for it, okay? Just straight up. And I was okay in the back, back what they call front of house and back house. Front of house where the waiters, the hostess, the salad bar guy or gal, the bar, that's all front of house. And you have back of house. And I did some back of house work. I worked on the line for a little bit, the cooking line, and I worked in dishes. And I was okay, but I'm a social person, so I always liked being in front of house. And everybody liked me. I mean, it was a fun place to work. Uh, it was great employees. But I just stunk at it. And I didn't enjoy it. You know, you ever been in a job you didn't work, right? You, you worked but just didn't enjoy it. It wasn't the people that I, I disliked. It was because I loved the people I worked with. 
but it was the, the job. And I remember praying to God, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, God, I, I want to get out of here. I, want to, I don't want to be here anymore, but it's not, I want you here just a little bit longer. I want you to really... He just kept saying that to me. And I finally got fed up, and I went and applied for another job, and I got it. And the time came to put in my two weeks' notice, and I felt this check in my spirit, and I ignored it. You ever ignored something that you just kind of were like, I, I, I feel like, you know, but I ignored it, and I went ahead, and I took the job. I worked at this other job for three and a half months, and through a misunderstanding, lost the job. And then I ended up without a job for three and a half months. Not that I didn't apply for a job, but it was, you have to understand how college towns work, right? College towns, you can't just go out and get new jobs mid-year. All, the jo all those jobs are taken up for the most part. It's really hard to find a job once school starts, especially those little, those, those easy jobs that are flexible. And so I called my dad and said, Dad, I can't find a job. And so he helped me out a little bit and got me through to about uh, uh, till I could find a job, which was the only time I ever had to ask him for help. Glory be to God, right? But it was, it was humbling for me because I realized God was try had tried to warn me about this situation, this other job situation, which also actually had worse dynamics as far as health. So I might not have been good at the first job, but at least it was a healthy dynamic for me. Does that make sense? The second one was even more unhealthy for various reasons. And what I learned through that was God has a plan. And he has a promise. He's going to take care of us. And in fact, in First chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. That's why sometimes you always hear, you hear especially the, the old-time the old preachers, they'll say yes and amen. This is where that comes from. All of God's promises. And we are children of that promise. That's what Paul's getting at in this passage. Is yes and amen. Is that you are children of the promise. You are children of the free woman. You're not children of the slave woman. That God is bringing you into his promise. And yes, we have to do our part. We have to listen. We have to, you know, harking back a little bit to that story of Sarah and Abraham. We can't get ahead of God. As a church, as individuals. And that's easy to do. But can I just encourage you this morning? That God is calling you to something powerful, to something new. That in coming out of this year that has been more like the Hunger Games than a, a life, a year, that God is calling you to something greater out of it. God is not calling you to another year of necessarily of struggle. I really do believe that God is going to not only, that our church is not going to, uh, not only going to prosper out of COVID-19, out of this year, but you will prosper out of it. Why? Because God there's a God of promise. He, he wants the best for his children. And I have sensed that very strongly since day one that, you, that we are going to be a church, that this is going to be our defining hour. And I want you to hear that this morning. I want you to hear that vision. I, I've, I've said it to the board. Josh and I have talked about it a lot. And I've even preached it over the last six months. But I want to say it one more time that we are children of the promise, that God has a purpose for your life, that, that we have the purpose for this church, and that we're going to come out of this stronger than when we went in. And we already are. Not just because of our online presence, but also because that He's building strength in us through this season. 
We just got to trust that his promise, that his promise is, uh, is being fulfilled in us. And I think that's what the Galatians, when we, when we start to look, when we look, take a second to look back at everything that Paul said, that's what the Galatians were struggling with. They were struggling to let go of their old ways. And, you know, churches deal with that too. Man, there are some things we don't do anymore. I'm not in a tie and suit this morning. It's, so some of you probably are chagrined, right? <laughs> but you're not in ties and suits either, so amen to that, right? But we've, we've let go of some of those old things. Why? Because we realize what's important is our relationship with God. That's the most more important thing. We want other people to realize that's more important. Not that we aren't dressed nice. I'd like to think I dress nice. No, no comments from the peanut gallery, all right? But that, but that we're, we're looking at the fish that we have in front of us and going, what's the best bait? They, they need to hear about the promise too. But are we letting go of the things that is saying, you know, God, you've done it in the past. You can do it in the future. But I'm going to let go of the way. I'm not going to say that, God, you did it this way now, so well, now you've got to do it the same way this, this time. He might do it a completely different way, and that's okay. That's hard for pastors, too, because we get in ruts. But God's calling us to a promise, not a way of doing things. And yes, there are things that are un, non-negotiable in, in His Word. But this morning, I just as I close, I want to make sure that we understand that God is calling you this morning to be children of this promise, to be children that, that come out of slavery, that come out of the things that bind us up, and to live as children of the Most High God. Easy to say, much harder to live. Just like my parable earlier. We can push on that rock a long time. Sometimes it feels, that's, what it, that's, what, that's what obeying God feels like. You know, we're pushing on the, it feels almost pointless sometimes. But can I tell you, through personal experience, I've been called to some hard places in my ministry to some hard things, and I can tell you that I, I look back on it and wouldn't trade some of those experiences from the world. Some of them I still might actually trade. God's still working on me. But so, most of them, I, I've accepted that God was doing something in me in that moment. Maybe that's you and where you're at this morning. And I, I just want to encourage you that through this time of worship that we had, um, or if you just need to talk, that, we're, that I'm available both the, during the week and after church here. And I just, because sometimes I just sense that that's the response that we should have this morning. We kind of had already had our altar time. It was kind of weird. But God is calling, I think, you to, and me to submit to the process, to submit to the, to the, to the free, the freedom that we have. And that's not always easy with where we're at. So with that said, I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And, uh, and then I'll have a few closing comments. Father, we just give you this time. And Lord, we just ask that the power of God would rest with each and every person, that we realize that we are children, that we are your children, and that we are children of the promise. We're not slaves to sin and death and, and the, the ways that we used to do things that we are free from those things, that anything that maybe we've done in the past or even in the things that, that we, we are ashamed of or regret, Lord, they're gone. You've set us free. And Lord, I just pray that, God, that you would give strength and power, Lord, to each and every person, the power of a son, the power of a daughter, and God, we worship you and we thank you this, this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.